Well, thank you for coming back and joining with us again today. We're going to continue our series on the names of God. And we're going to talk about a really cool one today. We're going to talk about El Shaddai. Now, El Shaddai is a name that is very significant. In fact, as we go through these names, you're going to notice that there's instances in which a person, a, a man or a woman or, or somebody within the scriptures refers to God by a name based on something that happened. Uh, they are in a situation, God moves in a magnificent way, and then they refer to God as a result of that. They refer to God in a specific way. In this instance, God seriously refers to himself by this name. He calls himself this name, which makes it a little bit more significant in my estimation, where it is significant that a person is looking at God and saying, you are this, I recognize your attribute in, in this way, and so I'm calling you this. But for God to look at himself and to, to call out his own attribute, it's usually in an effort, in an effort to demonstrate to us who he is, to reveal himself to us. So the significance in that respect uh, is amazing. I mean, how many of us really want to know God more and we want God to reveal himself? And here are instances in which God is revealing himself. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And I only put up part of it because the first part talks about how Abraham was... Uh, was older and then it says this point and, and I want to say this is something that I didn't bring up before you might notice that a lot of times especially when we look at this inter interlinear we're going the wrong way that's because Hebrew goes right to left where English goes left to right so in every one of these instances we're gonna start on the far right and move left and then go down and go back to the right and to the left which makes it interesting for us because then if we were to read the name of God here for instance we would read from right to left and then when we transliterate it and transliterating is just basically taking the Hebrew word and writing the Hebrew word with English letters we would write it from left to right. So uh, that can be a little bit confusing for some people getting into Hebrew, um, but we're just gonna try and, and deal with it and go with it. But in this instance, we have a very specific instance in which Yah is talking to Abraham. In, in this instance, it's actually before Abraham becomes Abraham, he's still Abram. And so Yah to Abram, and he says to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. So if we look, this is our instance in which God refers to himself. He says, I am El Shaddai. Now, our first two lessons, we talked about the first two names of God. In Genesis 1, we have Elohim. And then in Genesis 2, we have Yah, our Elohim. And I told you that those two were going to be kind of the main building blocks for the rest of what we deal with in this series. Those are going to be the names that all other names are built on. So I want you to notice that in this instance, El which is short for Elohim, is the one that we are building off of. So he starts, God starts speaking to Abram, but he's recognized as Yah, Yah speaking, but when he refers to himself, he basically says, I'm Elohim Shaddai, or El Shaddai. So God uses that initial um, moniker 
which is basically just a, a depiction of divinity. And we even said that it was somewhat generic because it does get used uh, in other instances in reference to other people and other deities, especially false deities, even though that is clarified in the scriptures when it is referring to false deities. But in this instance, he's, he's referring to himself as El Shaddai. Now Shaddai is where we run into a little bit of, uh, a little bit of issue because there's some debating between what we're actually looking at. Uh, a lot of us look at this and we see God Almighty and that's what our translations say. And if we look back, we can actually get into uh, translations and see why certain words were translated certain ways. A lot of us don't realize, but most of our early English translations were not translated from the Hebrew. They were actually translated from the Greek Septuagint. So we had a Greek translation and we translated the Greek translation into English, which means we didn't have the opportunity to look at a Hebrew word and choose the best English to explain it. We were actually not removed one culture from our translation. We were removed two cultures from our translation, Hebrew to Greek and Greek to English. And then above and beyond that, you also have the culture that the English translations were written in, especially when you get into King James, which is written in an Elizabethan English. So you have that cultural difference too. Uh, so I don't want you guys to sit there and think I'm trying to dump on your translations or say that they're poor or that they are not adequate or anything of that nature. I'm not trying to say that in any way, shape, or form. All I'm trying to convey to you is that there is a depth to the scriptures that we don't see. And many of the times what we look at through our English translation is just scratching the surface. Um, and you get a lot of that in, in languages, especially dealing with translating from one language to another. A word might not translate very well to another word because it has a culture and a background and an idea behind it in one culture. And then we're trying to shift all of that with a single solitary word. So what we run into in this instance is <clears throat> we have... El Shaddai, and when the, they were, the Greek Septuagint translators were looking at it, so they, tr they looked at it and they figured that it was coming from the Hebrew word Shaddad, which is translated overcome. In this instance, referring to a person, it would be an overcomer. So when we look at this, we're looking at an almighty overcoming force. And so for that reason, when we look at our translation, our English translation, a lot of uh, versions will translate this as God Almighty. And I know a lot of you have heard that. You've heard the phraseology, El Shaddai, God Almighty, or Almighty God. And God is mighty, and God is almighty, God is all-powerful. Um, so I'm not trying to say that that's not correct. I believe that that is a correct statement. But the question becomes, is Shaddai from the root word Shaddad? And then there are some other options, because it might not be from the root word Shaddad. It might be from the root word Shaddah, which is uh, in reference to the breast. And this has led some to say that it might mean that God is the many-breasted, the many-breasted God. And it's an, an effort to show that God is there to comfort and that God is there to provide, that God is there to, to be everything that you need. That 
also is a true statement. Um, so a lot of people have jumped onto this concept, but in all reality, and, and just to be perfectly blunt, this is a belief that Jewish theologians just are adamantly against. They do not like this choice of verbiage. They think that that is completely wrong. Um, Jewish theologians actually believe that Shaddai does not come from the word Shaddad, but that it's a, it's a connection of two words. That it's, a, that it's Sha and Dai put together. Two words put together. Now, Sha, which would be with this Shin letter right here, Sha means who? And they would use that in reference to a person. Um, and, and it would be used the same exact way that we use who. If we were to say, who are you? Or who's there? This is the same exact way. But then the other word die comes from a word that means sufficient. So the translation for this instance would be God who is sufficient. Now for us, I, I, I really believe that a lot of times we get caught up in sufficiency, in something being sufficient, and we don't like that word a lot of times in, in American culture. We think that if something is sufficient, that it's just barely enough. We, if, if we go, hey, do you have enough food? You might say, I have a sufficient amount of food, which means I have enough to do what I'm doing, but I don't have any extra food. I don't have anything beyond that. So we look at it in, in a way that there's a, a finiteness. Now in Jewish mindsets, sufficiency isn't that connection to finiteness. Sufficiency is completeness. See, if God is sufficient, no more is necessary. God is everything. God is everything that you need. He is all sufficient. There, there doesn't need to be any extra because God already knows how much is necessary. If, if we were to put this in terms, in military terms, if I, was, if I had an army and I said, I need to go and invade this other country. I might say 10,000 soldiers is not enough because they have 20,000 soldiers. So I might sit there and try and figure out how many soldiers I need to go in there and win the victory. And then, because we don't know what's going on, we would say, how many soldiers do I need? Well, that's the minimum. That's my minimum. And then we would add on to that how many we think beyond that will make sure that everything goes according to plan. Because we don't always know. We don't always know the whole force. We don't know every aspect. Maybe they have people that we don't know about. Maybe they have armor that we don't understand or weaponry that, that they have hidden. We don't have a way of knowing, so we think of sufficiency as a minimum. But if I know every single aspect in that scenario, and I know everything that they are coming at me with, then I can figure out exactly what I need to win the day. At that point, my victory is assured. So what we're talking about is not a situation where God has just enough to get by. God's victory is always assured. He is always sufficient. He's never lacking. And he never gets to a point where there's more needed because he is always there. 
And, and the same thing goes for each and every one of us. And that's one, one of the reasons that I, I look at this and, and think this is probably the most accurate word to use in this instance. <clears throat> because when he's talking to Abram in this passage, he says, I am God who is all sufficient. Walk before me and be blameless. Now this word blameless comes from the word tamim. And tamim is used a lot in Hebrew scriptures. And it's not only blameless, but it's also completeness. So he's telling Abram, Abram, if you will walk with me, you will be complete because I am everything you need. And then it takes on a little bit more. I mean, if we looked at this passage beforehand, we'd say, yeah, God is almighty. I agree with that. I don't have any qualms or issues with that whatsoever. God is almighty. And if I walk with him, yeah, I will be blameless. Because, I mean, we're talking about God here. But if God is saying, I am everything you need, and if you walk before me, you will be complete, then it takes on a whole nother meaning. It, it adds some depth to, to truths that we already recognized and understood, truths that we already received, but now it just has a depth. Now, because the Jewish mindset looks at Shaddai in this way, Shaddai is very important in Jewish history, in Jewish culture. In fact, um, I, I brought a couple of items to show you because when the Israelites looked at Scripture, a lot of times they were very... Um, I don't want to say legalistic. That's not really the term. They were literalist in a lot of instances. If, if God said, do this, they would literally do it. So when God said, put my, or my uh, word on the doorposts of your house, Jewish people were like, okay, we're going to go do that. We're going to go put God's word on the doorposts. And so they, they invented a thing in Jewish uh, culture called a mezuzah. And some of you might know what this is and some of you might not. And I actually brought one today. The mezuzah is simply a canister that holds the Shema. Now the Shema is basically, it's, it's a blessing. And it comes from, and in fact, most of these will actually have inscribed on them, Shema Yisrael. And it comes from Deuteronomy, where it says, Hear, O Israel. And that's what Shema means. It means hear. And then Yisrael, O Israel. Hear, Israel. And then it goes into the, the end-all, be-all foundation of Jewish belief in God. In Deuteronomy, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And so they would take that scripture, they would put it into their mezuzah, into the back, and then they would mount it on their doorpost at an angle. And then they put the letter Shin, which is this uh, letter right here, that you will see a crude depiction of written on my board. And then you'll also see it right here in Shaddai. It's the very first letter. And they put this letter here basically to point to Shaddai. That this letter Shin is right there. And as they would walk by, devout Jewish people would kiss it and pray that God's blessings, that El Shaddai's blessings would be upon them. That he would 
protect and watch over and, and, and provide in every way, shape, and form. And so they had this marking the blessing, this shortened form of Shaddai. And so much so, this became important in Jewish culture that a lot of times Jewish priests, when they bless people, when they proclaim a blessing, they would make this same letter, this Shin, in honor of this, this name Shaddai, they would make this letter with their hands. And they would lift up their hands in this fashion, and they would proclaim a blessing over Jewish people. Now, we might recognize it because Leonard Nimoy was raised by his parents who were Jewish immigrants. And Leonard Nimoy took half of that emblem for his live long and prosper. And that's a true story. He, he literally took a Jewish blessing and, and put that for all time into our, uh, into our, the minds of our kids and, and you guys and you ladies and your kids and your kids' kids. And, and he, he basically, every time he did that, that uh, hand gesture and was speaking a blessing, he was speaking a blessing for all intents and purposes in the name of El Shaddai. Which, and I, I guarantee you, if you take some time to Google it, it will demonstrate that everything that I have said is true and I'm not making this up. But it shows how important this name is to the Hebrew people and how important it can be to us because it's, it's not just a depiction that God is strong and that God is powerful. It's a depiction that God is everything. And, and think about it this way. I don't care what you're going through. God is sufficient. I don't care if you need healing. Guess what? God is sufficient. He has everything that it takes to bring healing. I don't care if you're dealing with um, addiction. Guess what? God is sufficient. I don't care if you're dealing with with any kind of sin or any kind of uh, immorality. I don't care what kind of trials you're facing. We are sitting here in the middle of this pandemic with people starting to freak out. But guess what? You do not have to be afraid because our God is sufficient. He is everything that we could need. He is everything that we could ever want. He is our all in all. And if we too will walk before God, we too will be complete in Him. Thank you.